Chapter 11, Beauty and Duty. In the above lights, it may be worthwhile to say a few words on the subjects of art and morality. Beauty and duty are two of the great formative ideas of which we have spoken. They operate especially in the more advanced sections of the human race, and wherever they make their appearance, they modify life profoundly. Like all the ideas, they are on one side an incommunicable, unanalyzable, innate feeling or sense. On the other side, they are structural and built up of many and various elements. The sense of beauty, the sense of duty, are each peculiar, unique feelings. They may be little or much developed, little or much manifested, but they come from within and are as indescribable as the peculiar smell of a flower. On the other hand, they express and manifest themselves externally in endlessly various forms and structures. If we remember what has already been said about the race life, we shall see that the idea of beauty or the idea of duty will take form in the long succession of the generations of the race, largely in accordance with the conditions of that life. That is, the one life or being or self of the race, impelling its individual members to honor and cherish the race in each other, or to sacrifice themselves for it, will stamp upon each individual mind a particular form or type of beauty or duty, which, through the repetitions of heredity, will be emphasized and fixed. Though such forms or types will differ much from each other in different races, and will depend along what particular external lines the great formative ideas are able to work in the given cases. Thus the ideals of the various races are formed. Thomas Hardy, in his very characteristic poem, The Well-Beloved, figures a man walking far one morning over hill and dale to visit his bride, and dreaming as he goes of her faultless form. Quote, The God-created norm of perfect womankind, and, lo, a shape like that he dreams glides so softly by his side, so like that he asks it, Art thou she? And the shape with equivocal voice replies, Thy bride remains within her father's grange and grove. And he, Thou speakest rightly, I broke in, Thou art not she I love. But again the shape replies, Nay, Though thy bride remains inside her father's walls, said she, the one most dear is with thee here, for thou dost love but me. The man is puzzled, but when he reaches the end of his journey, things become clearer, for he finds his mortal bride indeed, but her look was pinched and thin, as if her soul had shrunk and died, and left a waste within. And the mystery is made manifest, namely, that the ideal and the real woman are two very different apparitions. O fatuous man, this truth infer, brides are not what they seem, thou lovest what thou dreamest her, I am thy very dream. Here the distinction between the mortal woman and the ideal norm of womankind is made very apparent, and the suggestion is of course made that the former derives her attractiveness merely from the fact of her arousing a reminiscence of the latter. On the subject of beauty, an immense amount has been written, and Tolstoy in his What is Art, though he only deals with writers of the last two centuries, manages to quote some fifty or sixty answers given to the question, What is beauty? Whether we agree with his somewhat contemptuous treatment of the philosophers, and their divergencies or not, we cannot but be impressed by the fact that such an amazing amount of intellectual activity has been expended on this subject during that period, as indicating indeed its importance. And here it is interesting to find that Tolstoy groups the fifty or sixty answers of the philosophers under two fundamental conceptions. Quote, the first is that beauty is something having an independent existence existing in itself. That is one of the manifestations of the absolutely perfect, of the idea, of the spirit, of will, or of God. The other is that beauty is a kind of pleasure received by us, 
not having personal advantage for its object. Both classes of definition Tolstoy considers unsatisfactory. The first, because it dwells in a vague and unknown region of mysticism, and is, quote, a fantastic definition founded on nothing. The second, because it descends to mere physiology and the senses. But to us, surely, both are highly interesting. In fact, we see that philosophy only gives two answers to the question. The one is practically that of Plato, the other is that of modern science. The one places the sentiment of beauty in the perception of an absolute existence in the heavens, the other in the reception of a pleasure not having personal advantage for its object. That is, in a pleasure inspired or generated by something beyond the personal life. Both therefore agree in considering the sentiment of beauty to be derived from our continuity with an order of existence beyond what we usually call our own. In the view of Plato, the dream figure, which walked by the man's side, was a reminiscence of some celestial form seen long ago, but still dwelling there, far in the heavens. In the view of heredity, it was the revivescence within the mind, of a luminous form, the complex product or manifested presence, of ages of race consciousness and memory. In either case, it was the waking of another order of consciousness within the man. I shall now, even though the evidence may not seem absolutely conclusive, assume that this general aspect of the question is the right one, and proceed to inquire what we may infer from it. In the first place, it would seem that if the dream figure walking beside the man is merely the rehabilitation of some memory within him, its connection with the living mortal woman to whose feet he is making his pilgrimage is of the slightest, and that in the, that view love is indeed a sad illusion, as Thomas Hardy, in his pessimistic way, seems to suggest. The dream figure, which is the real inspiration of the man's love and devotion, is a merely subjective fancy, and the mortal woman only the painful actuality, which by some accident chanced to recall a dream. But it will easily be seen that the whole point of my endeavor hitherto, on this subject, will have been missed if the kind of vision with which we are dealing be thus characterized as merely subjective. Taking the hereditary view, we cannot refuse to see that the race life, which builds up and projects these visions, dreams, and glamours, is intensely real, and that the visions, etc., are quite real and necessary manifestations of it. This race life is, as a matter of fact, within each of us, and forms the chief, though a subconscious, part of our individual selves. We, as conscious individuals, are simply the limbs and prolongations of it. When, therefore, Thomas Hardy's pilgrim sees the, quote, God-created norm of womankind, walking beside him, he sees something which, in a sense, is more real than the figures in the street, for he sees something that has lived and moved for hundreds of years in the heart of the race, something which has been one of the great formative influences of his own life and which has done as much to create those very figures in the street as qualities in the circulation of the blood may do to form a finger or other limb. He comes into touch with a very real presence or power, one of those organic centers of growth in the life of humanity of which we have spoken, and feels this larger life within himself, subjective, if you like, and yet intensely objective, and more, for is it not also evident that the woman, the mortal woman who excites the vision, has some closest re relation to it, and is indeed far more than a mere mask or empty formula which reminds him of it? For she indeed has within her, just as much as the man has, deep subconscious powers working, and the ideal which has dawned so entrancingly on the man is in all probability closely related to that which has been working most powerfully in the heredity of the woman, and which has most contributed to mold her form and outline. 
No wonder, then, that her form should remind him of it. Indeed, when he looks into her eyes, for all that she be pinched and thin, he sees through to a far deeper life, even than she herself may be aware of, and yet which is truly hers, a life perennial and wonderful. The more than mortal in him beholds the more than mortal in her, and the gods descend to meet. That there are many norms and ideals moving and working within the man, within the woman, and within the race, goes without saying, and these, as we have said farther back, are continually growing from age to age, accreting, advancing, and branching in the various sections, branches, families, individuals even, of the race. The gods are no changeless inviolate beings, but, at any rate as far as their manifestation is concerned, may be thought of as continually growing, evolving, as Robert Buchanan says, fed with the blood and tears of living things, nourished and strengthened by creation's woes, the God unborn that shall be king of kings, sown in the darkness through the darkness grows. Furthermore, it is pretty evident that, as each individual naturally stands more under the influence of one ideal or organic center than the other, and will differ from other individuals in the proportion and arrangement of his centers, so all will fall into groups, so to speak, under their various gods. Thus Plato, in the Phaedrus, explains that Zeus and the various gods move through heaven, each followed by a company of souls, who thus gain a glimpse of the things of the celestial world. And afterwards, when they are fallen to earth, each soul still implicitly belongs, quote, to that particular God of whose choir he was a member, and seeks for his love and mate among such souls. They then that belong to Zeus seek to have for their beloved one who resembles Zeus in his soul. Similarly, the followers of Hera or Apollo or any other god walk in the ways of the god, seek a love who is to be like their god, and when they have found him, they themselves imitate their God, and persuade their love to do the same, and bring him into harmony with the form and ways of the God as far as they can. Thus the man and woman drawn together by great forces deep lying in the race, reveal to each other their own deep-rooted divinity. And truly, when love comes between them, there comes for the first time something like real knowledge, there comes also a transformation which may be seen, a change in glory which is as real and obvious to the senses as it is far-reaching and miraculous in spiritual significance. And may we not say, as Schopenhauer says, that it is in this meeting of the ideas that the sense of beauty, that the art sense everywhere consists. When an idea that is struggling for expression within us meets with and recognizes the same idea, itself indeed, expressed again in some outer form, be it man or woman, or flower or slumbering ocean. There is an infinite sense of relief, of recognition, of rest, of unity. We are delivered from our little selves, our little desires and unrest, and with the eyes of the gods we see the gods. And I take it that it is much the same with the sense of duty. Much has been written about the categoric imperative and the stern daughter of the voice of God. It is sufficient to see that such expressions point towards a transcendent consciousness, without feeling it necessary to accept all they imply. The sense of duty derives primarily and essentially from the sense and the fact of oneness between ourselves and our fellows. Structurally, and through the centuries, it may grow and be built up in forms of laws and customs, and out of lower motives of fear and conformity. But ultimately, and in all these forms, it is the common life asserting itself, and the sense of the common life and unity. George Santayana, in his very suggestive book on The Sense of Beauty, points out that fear, involving subconsciousness of terrors, death, disease, etc., lies behind duty, 
while love, involving subconsciousness of health, vitality, and all pleasurable things, lies behind beauty. And so we may see that the earlier consciousness of the race, wherein fear and the unfriendly gods play so important a part, gives birth to the sentiment of duty, while the later consciousness endues the beauty form. In Wordsworth, we may discern the transition taking place. Flowers laugh before thee on their beds, and fragrance in thy footing treads. And among the Greeks, already moral actions had become beautiful, and were accounted desirable, because they were beautiful. In the end, it is the sense of oneness, and of the one life, which underlies these two and perhaps many other enthusiasms, and may we not think that both duty and beauty, the sense of morality and the sense of art, when they at last realize their own meaning, are taken up and surrender themselves in an idea of an even higher order, namely that of love. That this sense of the one life, of the race, or of humanity, is not a mere figment, but a very living reality, many folks' experience will testify. Sometimes, under deep emotion rousing the whole being, there comes a glimmering yet distinct consciousness of this age-long existence. Of such a mood Walt Whitman's poems show many examples, but none perhaps more striking than those first lines of Children of Adam. Amorous, mature, all beautiful to me, all wondrous. My limbs and the quivering fire which ever plays through them for reasons most wondrous. Existing, I peer and penetrate still, content with the present, content with the past. By my side or back of me, Eve following, or in front, and I following her, just the same. The existence of various orders of consciousness is a conception which is becoming familiar today. What with the subliminal consciousness of F. W. Myers, and the psychical researchers, the subconscious mind of the hypnotists, the race memory and heredity of the biologists, the cosmic consciousness of some late writers, the ecstasy of the Christian mystics, and the samadhi of the Indian, Indian Ganani's, we have abundant evidence of a yet unexplored world within us, and some have sought to show that there is a complete gradation onwards from the mere consciousness of the animals through the self-consciousness of the human being, to family, tribal, and race consciousness, and so upward to the cosmic life and nirvana. The important thing, I think, at present, without attempting to go into any detail on the subject or to classify what is yet unknown, is to see that undoubtedly various orders of consciousness do exist, actually embedded within us, and that the words I and thou do not merely cover our bodily forms and the outlines of our minds, as we habitually represent them to ourselves, but cover also immense tracts of intelligence and activity, lying behind these and only on occasion coming into consciousness. Yet these tracts belong to us and are ourselves quite as much as, and perhaps more intimately than, those commonly recognized. It is the waking of these tracts, and their inbrush on the field of ordinary consciousness, which is held to explain so many phenomena of our psychic and religious experience. To command these tracts in such a way as to be able to enter in and make use of them at will, and bring them into permanent relation with the conscious ego, will I think be the method of advance and the means by which all these questions of the perjuration and reincarnation of the ego, and of its real relation with other egos, will at length be solved. If we could by any means explore and realize what is meant by that letter I, if we could travel inward with firm tread to its remotest depth, and find the regions where it touches close, so close on the other forms of the same letter, if we could stand assured and look around us, in that central land where it ceases to convey the sense of difference and only indicates unity, and if then with lightning swiftness we could pass to the extreme periphery 
where in its particular and invincible shape it almost rejoices to stand alone antagonizing the rest of the universe. Why then, surely all would be clear to us, and gladness and beauty would be our perpetual attendance. It is through the deepening of consciousness that these results will gradually be obtained, and the forms of the race consciousness are perhaps intermediary stages on the way. For as we have seen, it is in the constitution of things that the large and harmonious should prevail over the petty and discordant, and there is a kind of necessity driving us in the happier direction. In memory and experience, the overlaying of images tends to the mutual obliteration of defects and excrescences, and the production of a composite and ideal finer than any single specimen. And, just as in the case of musical sounds transmitted a long distance through the air, the discords cancel each other, leaving harmony in the end. So, in hereditary transmission, the elements which are mutually harmonious prevail. The organic centers in the race, or in the individual, which tend to strength, peace, harmony, life, persist, those which tend to unbalance, pettiness, decay, and mutual conflict, dissolve and disappear. The angels overcome and eject the devils. The root truths, qualities, powers of the universe move ever forwards to their expression. Beauty, amid the tangle of the superficial and unfinished, shows itself more and more. Man rises from the life of his petty self to that of his family, his tribe, his race, mankind, finding his greater self each time in these. And as he does so, his gods lose more and more their deformity and terror, and become clothed with harmony and grace. The primitive gods, the early idealizations, are more local, partial, they represent the mental states of unformed people living in tribes, families, localities. They are grotesque, fearsome, foolish, these Typhons, Mexitlis, Bulls, Grizzlies, Dagons, Satans, and other monsters. Yet they linger in all of us still, incarnations of foolish heart-quakings and prejudices, which, though dismissed by our better reason, still haunt the twilight grounds of our subconsciousness. Farther on and higher in development, we come to such beautiful impersonations as Apollo, Aphrodite, Demeter, Isis, Mary, representing far profounder movements and intuitions of the human mind, or to those general tendencies to deify the king or the warrior or the saint, which may be found in most races. And all of these, too, linger in us, inspiring the great mass of our religion poetry, ideals, and those enthusiasms which lift us out of daily life into other spheres of emotion and experience. But all these refer to particular aspects of humanity. It is only with the incoming of democracy in its largest sense that the idealization of the common man and woman, of the human being, irrespective of all adornments, occurs. The Egyptian could see plainly that the mighty Pharaoh, as he drove by in his chariot, was a god, but he could not see that the negro slave, who flicked the flies from his royal master, was equally divine. But Whitman boldly says of the men and women of the street, quote, What gods can exceed these that clasp me by the hand? For him the sight of a simple human being was sufficient to wake the glow and halo of divinity. This latent and greatest idealization proceeds clearly from the fact that the image or object in such cases rouses the glorified consciousness, not of any one line of experience and memory, not of any particular aspect or section of the race, but of humanity itself. When the consciousness in a man has deepened, so far that is, it is in touch with that of humanity, then clearly any human being may wake that deeper consciousness, and its awakening is accompanied by a sense of glory, wonderment, and perennial splendor as great or perhaps greater 
than that which accompanied the visions of the elder gods. Here in this perennial immeasurable consciousness sleeping within us, we come again to our celestial city, our home from which as individuals we proceed, but from which we are never really separated. It is surely some intimation and sense of this, some need of its revelation, which gives for us the charm of utopias and dreams of paradise and cities of the sun. What exactly our relation as individuals to that whole and to each other, and what our relation to the past and future may be, are questions which for the present we need not trouble ourselves with. When it is realized that the central life is, and lives and moves within us, that it is in some sense ourselves, these questions will largely fall away. Every man feels doubtless that his little moral life is very inadequate, and that to express and give utterance to all that is in him, he would need many lives, many bodies. Even what we have been able to say here shows that the deeper self of him, that which is the source of all his joy and inspiration, has had the experience of many lives, many bodies, and will have.